Hello and welcome to this episode of the Children of Mary podcast. We are Mary's children, and this is her podcast. Live with me in the studio is Claire. I have very bad news. Claire's still here. She's pushing the buttons. She's moving the dials, but we're not going to be able to see her. We only have three camera angles, and we have a special guest in the studio. So we entrust a fourth camera angle of its Mary's will to Mary to bring it to us and to provide it for us because we out of cash. <laughs> in the studio with me as well is my brother and the blessed mother, <laughs> Keenan. That was great. It was a pretty good one, That right? was pretty great, yeah. And with him and with us is his brother from the same mother, Adrian. Thank you for having me. Claire, my dear. Yes. When Adrian first came back to us from the world, because I used to teach Adrian, I taught him <laughs> for three years. When he was in the sixth grade, I think he was 11 years old, I taught him math to the, best of, to the best of my ability. He tried. Albeit poorly. Then seventh and eighth grade, I taught him religion. Boy, I saw a great transformation. And he, you know, he went the way of the world for a little while, but he came back to us. And the first year that he came back to us, we had two Adrians in our high school core team. And how would I differentiate between the two Adrians? Your son. Adrian, my son. Adrian, my son, looks a little bit like a young Padre Pio, some might say. So we'll see if you follow. I was told that once, yeah. We'll see if we follow in the footsteps. Let us go ahead and begin this program by consecrating it to the Virgin Mary because, again, this is Mary's podcast. We're doing the best we can to do what she wants, say what she wants us to say, and be her in the world. So let's begin. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. 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 Blessed Virgin Mary, we consecrate this show to you. Everything that we do, everything that we are, everything that we hope for, it's all yours. We are your instruments. We want to be tools in your hand. Use us, broken as we are, to do good in the world. We consecrate our lives to you. Everything, everything, our hopes, our dreams, our families, our death, our life, our weaknesses, and our strengths, we give them to you that you might glorify your son, Jesus Christ, through them. Be present with us in this room as we do our podcast. Help us to have a sense of your presence. Help our viewers and listeners to have a sense of your presence and a sense of your peace. And come, Holy Spirit, come by means of the powerful intercession of the Immaculate Heart of Mary, thy well-beloved spouse. Come, Holy Spirit, come by means of the powerful intercession of the Immaculate Heart of Mary, thy well-beloved spouse. Come, Holy Spirit, come by means of the powerful intercession of the Immaculate Heart of Mary, thy well-beloved spouse. Saint Joseph, pray, pray for, for us. us. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. One or two housekeeping things before we get started. So last week I said, if you want to find this podcast, go to True Faith Talks. I was wrong. On YouTube, if you want to watch this podcast, go to True Faith TV. Just search that, and that's where the podcast will be. Also, if you want to listen to it, for now, at this very moment, if you're watching this at this very second, you can get it at anchor.fm slash Mary's Podcast on Spotify, on a bunch of other places soon, very soon, hopefully by the time you're listening to this, you can also get it on iTunes and Google Podcasts. Second, Claire, when Claire first yes. got here, mm -hmm. she said she's a big fan of Gabby After Hours, but she had one <laughs> she had one major request. She kept saying, Gabriel. I said, where's all your merch? Where's the merch? Why can't we get merch? <laughs> why can't we get merch? And I don't know why I was putting off merch, partially because I don't want my face or my name on right, stuff. It's all about Mary. It's all about Mary. So finally, though, finally, Claire's getting very excited because we're starting to add merch. And I'm only going to be selling things that are good for the soul. And by me selling it, it's not like we're making a lot of money. This is like I'm getting like a dollar or two off this. But so the first thing I want to share with you, a merch that I have owned for like six years. I've given this to various people as gifts, and they've all loved it. What is it? Memento Mori mug. I like the alliteration. M-M-M. -M -M, Memento Mori mug. On it, it says Tempus Fugit, which is Latin for time flies. And it says Memento Mori, which means remember death. And it has a skull. Imagine you're going to the business room. You're going to the conference center. You're going to get coffee in the kitchen. And you got this mug out and it's got a skull on it. <laughs> People are a little bit intimidated by that. And that brings us to the topic of today. Many of the saints would even have skulls on their desk. This is not a real skull. This is a medical copy. I have one in my office. Sometimes people will see it in videos of mine. And they say, why are you being so morbid, Gabriel? What are you, some sort of Satanist? Why do you have skulls there? I would have you know that saints like St. Francis of Assisi, other great 
saints who try to live a contemplative life and, and an active life carried skulls with them to remind them of who they really are and what's really going to happen to them. In the book, The Imitation of Christ, there's a long passage about every day, go to bed thinking you're not going to wake up. In the morning, think I'm not going to live till the end of the day. St. John Bosco had a dream. He was very famous for his dreams. And he said that one day he had a vision in, in his dream and the Lord took him to heaven and he saw all of these people whose lives he touched and he's like wow that's pretty good and then the lord took him to another area and then there was way more people in this field that he could have touched and the lord said these are all the people that you could have touched if you only had faith during your life wow and so yeah. saint john bosco went back and of course he became more zealous and he weighed everything in the eyes of death saint ignatius of loyola he's very famous for discernment discernment of spirits and he says when you're trying to make a decision one of the ways to discern is weigh it with the thought of death before you. So a lot of the things that we do or that I do, purchases that we make, initiatives that we take, I don't want to do them. I don't want, for example, just the podcast. But then if I'm weighing this in the mind of death, I feel like Mary wants something of me. At the hour of my death, I'm going to be thinking of all of the ways I've failed. And one of the ways I could have failed was not giving to Mary what she's asking of me. So in all things, according to Ignatius of Loyola, we should weigh it weigh that decision with how we're going to view it at the hour of our death, because the hour of our death is really going to put a clear focus on things. Mother Angelica, a great woman of faith that I highly respect and look up to, would say that when she would go to a funeral and there was an open casket, she would purposely put her hand on the body and say to herself, this is where I'm going to be. And if you've ever done this, you put your hand on the dead body and it's like, you, you're like, there's nobody here. You're just touching like an empty shell, it feels like. Um, it's obviously was a temple of the Holy Spirit. It was the person that soul and the body are united. The souls left the body, but it reminds you very vividly, you are going to die. You are going to turn to nothing. I encourage people to go to funerals. It's a, it's a bad thing that, let's say one of your loved ones dies and you haven't been to a funeral, you've never seen a dead body before, it's very easy to get shocked by the way that they look because they're dead, their soul isn't in the body, and then you, you're not able to mourn them properly because you are just so shocked by the way a dead body looks. So I encourage all people, not only as a sign of paying respects to the living and, and the life and their legacy and to show the family your support and to pray for the, uh, their souls and the conversion of the people who are there, but it's important for your own sake, for your own spirituality, to, to see death, to see dead bodies. Um, I encourage people to take their children to funerals. A lot of times people are scared to take their kids because they don't want them to see a dead body. I don't want my child's first dead body to be mine. I don't want the first dead person that he sees to be his grandmother's or the first dead body that she sees to be somebody that they love. So I will, I've taken my children to all funerals of people that I would go to. I always try to take at least one kid to show them that death is a natural part of life. And St. Jacinta, shortly before her death, said, if men knew what eternity was, they would change their lives. If men knew what eternity was, they would change their lives. I remember last week, Keenan told us that part of his conversion was his brother taking the time to emphasize what eternity was. Very, very powerful. Now, before we get into our guest, we've got, man, our guest is amazing. I said earlier, <laughs> I said earlier that I was his teacher. Now, the teacher is the student. <laughs> now, he's teaching me. And you'll be like, wow, this guy is, he's good. I don't want to build him up because then what if he's <laughs> miserable? You. But uh, <laughs> but he's a good, he's a holy guy and he's constantly teaching me things. But first, you might be thinking, well, I don't want to think about death too much. That's morbid. In reality, looking at death frequently is just being more aware of reality. So I have, I've been reading a book by St. Alphonsus. I'm just going to give you a couple of quotes and it's called Preparation for Death. We'll talk more about St. Alphonsus in a moment, but basically in a nutshell, whatever St. Alphonsus says, it goes. Gregory the 16th would tell people studying moral theology, if St. Alphonsus held that opinion, you are free to teach it. Basically, he's a doctor of moral theology concerning faith and morals. St. Alphonsus is a clear guide, doctor of the church. So if St. Alphonsus says we should do this, we should meditate upon death, brothers and sisters, <laughs> if somebody's telling you not to, you better re-examine yourself. So briefly, thinking on death. This is what St. Alphonsus would say. He's like, oh, Gabe, that's so morbid. No, my brother, get ready, get ready for this. He says, picture to yourself a person who has recently expired, 
Behold that corpse lying on the bed, the head fallen on the chest, the hair disordered and bathed in the sweat of death, the eyes sunken, the cheeks hollow, the face an ashy hue, the tongue and the lips the color of lead, the body cold and heavy. But still more horrible is it when the body begins to decay. 24 hours have not elapsed since the death of that youth, and an offensive odor is already perceptible. The windows must be opened, incense must, incense must be burned, and haste must be made to transfer the body this is going to happen to and he goes on let me tell you what he goes on he goes on he says things like if you were rich they're not even thinking about you anymore they're thinking about all the money that you're leaving them and how they're going to spend it and if you were poor your family is going to be cursing you because you didn't leave them any money because you squandered it and they're like in the, the place where your dead body laid soon enough they're going to be in there dancing and carousing and partying and they're not even going to remember you anymore and so he basically, the, the first part of this book, he's like, everything that you think matters, and if it doesn't matter in the eyes of death, you're wasting your time. And then he says, what is this one on? We don't know when. It is appointed. It is then certain that we are all condemned to death. We are all born with the halter around our neck, says St. Cyprian. And every step we take brings us nearer to death. My brother, as your name has been one day registered in the book of baptism, so it will one day be registered in the book of death. And we don't know when it is. A lot of times I think our culture, we don't like to think about death. We don't like to think of the possibility that we can die. But if we're not ready now to die, what makes us ready later? Have you guys had any you know, encounters with death or thought about death a lot in your lives or had any kind of preoccupation with it? Uh, there was one night, I think... Um... It was a few years ago. I guess I ate too much one night, and I, I'm not kidding. I woke up, and, like, I was choking, oh and gosh. I, like, had this huge gasp of breath, and I woke up. Uh, praise God. So I you remember were in, in your sleep? I was sleeping, oh my gosh. And, I wo and I just I woke up upon bringing this huge gasp of breath, and I thought, oh, my gosh. <laughs> that, that easily could have happened. You could have died. Easily, easily could have. And I laid there, and I thought about it, and I... It, it took me a little while to go back to sleep um, because, you know, God kind of slapped me around a little bit and said, hey, look, <laughs> this none of this is guaranteed. Yeah. Claire and I work at a church and we get emails regularly that people have died. And because they're faithful people and we see them regularly, it's like one day, you know, this woman's here with her husband. The next day, the husband's gone. And it's, it's a regular, it, and it, we see it all the time, like the faithful people who are gone, and then we forget about them. So many people have died, like in my 10 years that I've been here, even just employees, like deacons, two deacons have passed away, um, death. I, I remember a personal experience that happened a while back that really had a horrible impact on me. And so I had asthma really, really bad. And I was suffering so bad and it, it caused like an interior darkness. Because it's one thing for me to make choices in the face of death. But it's another thing to like actually face it and face the unknown. And I went into like a severe depression and anxiety because of the thought that I'm going to actually have to go through this process. And because I personally got so close to dying, I was like, oh, I say I'm ready. I'm not ready. And added on top of that, there was a medication, and this is important for people, to always find out what medications that you're taking that the doctors are giving you, what the side effects are. Because this particular medication, one of the side effects was like extreme depression and anxiety. Under this medication, it was like, I'd think of my son and I'd be like, well, what's the point? I'm, we're just gonna die and he's gonna be taken from me. And wow, it was just like, it was like, it was like the darkest experience ever. And normally, worldly advice would be like, surround yourself with friends, this and that, and, and, and go out and enjoy yourself and go on vacation. But for me, what got me through it was actually facing death, like face to face and dealing at what the root of what was going on in here to like figure out why I wasn't ready. What was it about me that was holding back? And so personally, I found great solace in like studying Lourdes. I think I made my Lourdes video at that point because of all the miracles, mm -hmm. all the suffering of St. Bernadette. Um, and I, fo I found out that it wasn't just the medication. So at the hour of death, they say that the person who's dying attracts demons like flies attract to, to feces. They just attack you all at the last second. So although I wasn't dying, and only God knows when I was going to die, I think I really had a diabolical attack at that point. Um, and I say that because what actually got rid of this, like, 
extreme over, overflowing darkness was deliverance prayer. I just remember very clearly in the car one day, I was like, I've had enough of this. And I, and I, I yelled out this de deliverance prayer. I, I yelled out something along these lines. I can't remember exactly word for word. I yelled out really loud, top of my lungs. In the name of Jesus and Mary, I bind you fear. I bind you doubt. I bind you anxiety. And I cast you to the foot of the cross, never to return again. And then after that, immediately, like I was swelled up with so much like, confidence and courage. Mm -hmm. So although the medication made me more susceptible to it, all we have to remember that the devil will latch on to a weakness. So if he knows I'm susceptible to something, whether that be medically induced, chemically induced, physically, the devil's going to latch on and claw as hard as he can. And when I did that, it was like I was an animal after that. I was like, I wasn't afraid anymore. It was weird. It was it was it was weird because it was you can ask anybody in my family. It was a horrible, heavy darkness. But now I know, and and this goes for anything. This can go for lust, this can go for depression, anxiety. Whatever your weakness is at the moment, the devil is going to try and latch onto that. And so by calling upon the name of Jesus and Mary, and I'll, I'll repeat that prayer again. Basically, in the name of Jesus, I add Mary because I'm Marian. In the name of Jesus, I bind you spirit of blank. And I cast you to the foot of the cross to be judged by our Lord, not to return again. This has worked for me when my kids have been misbehaving. And you can just feel like when you're in a, and it can be in any situation, you're at work, you're dealing with somebody and they're acting irrational or there's a lot of high flying emotions. If there's some sort of high emotions, the devil is going there. Whether that we, earlier privately we were talking about, you know, temptations to lust and things that a boyfriend and a girlfriend could be doing. That's when the devil, when you're feeling these heightened emotions, that's when the devil is going to be like, whoo, because he can easily just latch onto the shoulder, start whispering his thoughts or mingling in with your thoughts. And then so if you can identify the temptation in the name of Jesus and Mary, I bind you spirit of blank. So just because I think about death a lot and I'm making choices about death, that doesn't mean that we are going to face death, you know, emotionally stable. So we got to focus. If you if you have a fear of death, focus on the present moment. Pray to St. Joseph for a happy death and be aware of the spiritual dimension and again any medications that you might you might be taking. And I think God like prepares you very well too. Like when I first time I ever really had experienced death, it was my grandmother's passing mm. and he prepared me by showing me books about purgatory mm. and how to pray for the souls in purgatory. So I think God's going to work any way for you as you yourself approach it, but also your family members. Um, and for me, when my grandma passed, it was like battle time. It was like time to save her soul. You know, she's meeting our Lord. Like it's time to like pray for her salvation and stuff. So, um, yeah, you just got to pray. I remember when Adrian originally was going off to seminary, we we're talking about his family. And I was like, one thing that you have to do is you need to be there for your father when like at the hour of his death. And I, I remember very specifically charging Adrian, when I'm dying, because he's gonna be a priest, when I'm dying, you must find a way to, to be with me at the hour of my death. Remember, remember we, we had no, this conversation? Yeah. Nice, nice conversation. Yeah, I know. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, Adrian's like gonna leave to be a priest and I'm more worried about the salvation of my soul. <laughs> but, uh, but it's important that you talk to family members, find family members to carry out your spiritual wishes Maybe they're not the best believers, but find people who are going to take care of your soul when you're in the throes of death. Find a friend, say, if I'm in the hospital and this happens, I need you by my side to pray X, Y, or Z prayer. I need you to make sure that a priest comes and do an X, Y, and Z. Mm -hmm. So that's why I'm vocations. We have to have vocations <laughs> ministry. I'm going to try and have as many, inspire as many priests as possible so they'll all be there. <laughs> yeah, I know. I tell, I mean, I, the more I think about it, um, I try and tell friends like, your family has to have a priest that they know that they can call any hour of the day when, when someone's about to die. You got to have that priest there. Um, and I, the more I've been thinking about it more and more and like we have friends whose parents are, are really sick. Um, and, and luckily, you know, even the pastor here, he went to see, um, this guy's mom. She, she has stage four cancer. Stage four cancer. Yes. Um, but yeah, just knowing, knowing who that priest is going to be like, just have him lined up and have his number because and you it's important that you find a priest who himself is not afraid to die especially with the covid and stuff i know that there's been you know elderly priests who are maybe more cautious and don't want to go places and then it's like we all know a very young priest who's like ready he's ready to die he's like <laughs> he's putting himself in <laughs> Indeed, i'm is. like dude are you like trying to die <laughs> no he's like no i've got a moral obligation to save souls whether whatever happens to me happens to me it's god's 
part of God's plan for me when I took my holy order. So very powerful. Now, Keenan, last week you told us that part of Adrian reaching into your life and besides asking you to pray was talking to you about, you know, eternity, yeah. the length of hell and stuff. So how are you preparing? How are you personally preparing to be ready for the hour of your death? The rosary. The rosary. <laughs> the Hail Marys. Because, you know, at the end of every, every Hail Mary is Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us now and at the hour of our death. And so you're saying that 150, 200 times a day. Yeah. Um, so, so, you know, when it comes to the hour of death, like you just said, that's when the devil tries his, his hardest to, to damn you, right? Like, you know, rosary day for praying four rosaries a day for your whole life. You know, from whenever you start to... Even till just the one. Day. Even, even just one. Even just one. Yeah. You know, there's all that, but yeah. But I mean, you're praying the four, the full rosary. Um, surely she will be there for you. And that's very reassuring, right? Um, and we were just talking earlier about instances where we kind of came in contact with death. I never, you know, it was kind of retrospect for me, but when I was in college, um, you know, there was definitely one occasion that I remember that I drank so much that I blacked out so i don't remember that night or anything but i know that my friends told me they all left me and i was passed out on this bed we were at this condo in galveston and i was passed out and then they i think went to waterburger or something like way late at night and came back and i had i was passed out on my back but i had rolled over somehow and thrown up in in my sleep um so it was purely by god's grace that i had rolled over and not asphyxiated right so there is multiple there is thank one, god i know i i, I really <laughs> never never heard that story the virgin you mary rolling over. Over. No. Adrian hasn't heard that one so that was that had that happened that was that wasn't even college that was senior year of high school and college you know my behavior never changed so that's one thing that i really when talking to my friends now and even people younger than me and you know adrian's friends and stuff like that is that maybe still living that lifestyle you can really, I mean, you can really die at any moment. You can go get in your car and, and get in a crash and it's a wrap. But living that lifestyle of going out and partying every weekend and using drugs, it can really just happen like that. And, you know, if you're living that lifestyle, you're not in a state of grace. And so that was really the thing that when Adrian was starting to come to me and I was still doing all those things um, was the real kind of catalyst to make me at least start taking it way more seriously. And I've tried to kind of do that with my friends too is, is kind of have that appeal at first. It's like, hey, you know, you're kind of, you're playing with fire. You're playing with Liter fire. And literally there's, playing there's with that, fire. I think it's Pascal's theory. It's like, you know, you make a bet, essentially. You, Not us, but you make a bet. You either, you know, live your whole life however you want, not thinking there's there's an afterlife. And then when you die, you know, it's like nothing happens to you, fine. Or you live your whole life living how you want and you die and you there is that after and you go to hell, right? It's like you, that's, that's that you're making this bet. And so why not? live the life that God calls us to live, right? Because even if, even say we get all the way and, and we die and then, and then nothing does happen, we die ever after having lived a great life, a virtuous yeah. life, right? A peace-filled so, life. A peace-filled life, exactly. So so preparing for death, yes, the rosary, yeah, the rosary is really is really what helped me focus on that. Um, and, and then... To be, to be fair, I... <laughs> He says that I was I brought him out of the darkness. I was just as bad as him for uh, for a number. Oh, I, of years. I let them know that last week. Oh, good, good, good. good. That's good. Yeah, good. Uh, we're open here. Um, but I remember when telling my friends like, so how how did you uh, revert to the faith? How did you come back? And I, I'm pretty sure the first thing that I tell most people is I didn't want to go to hell. There was an imperfect sorrow for what I had done. Um, and that's, I mean, that's where most people start when they come back is I, you know, I, w I wish I could sit here and say, I want to come back because everything I've done has been an, a an affront on God. And I'm so sorry, but no, it started with, I don't want to go to hell for eternity. Self-interest. But yeah. God works with that. He does. But he then, does. And then it, and then it grows does. in, it grows into, yeah. I want to live this life because of my love for God. Yeah. Cause the I mercy, I think maybe hurt. it's cause you're afraid of hell and then you experience his mercy probably that makes you like, Oh my gosh. God's yeah. You good. experience it. You experience God's grace. Um, and I was talking with, with our friend, um, and he was, he was actually talking about the priest that you mentioned earlier. He said, how do you, how do you get people to, you know, to believe and to really give them themselves to, to God and his church? And he said, you can say, any and everything you want, but until they experience his grace, there's only so much we can do.
Beautiful. They have to experience his grace. St. Uh, Louis de Montfort says that before you can get somebody to change the way they live, they first and foremost have to have a love for prayer and that experience of God and his grace in prayer. And going off of um, St. Louis, just in regards to how the rosary has helped me um, you know, keep that in mind, he does have this quote from this book, The Secret of the Rosary, um, ab about the power of the rosary mm -hmm. in terms of turning us and therefore yeah. really really helping us, you know, save our souls is even if you are on the verge of being damned, <laughs> even if you have one foot in hell, even if you have sold your soul to the devil as sorcerers do, even if you are a heretic as hardened and obstinate as a devil, sooner or later you will be converted and saved. If, mark well my words, <laughs> if you pray the Holy Rosary devoutly every day until death for the purpose of knowing the truth and obtaining contrition and forgiveness for your sins. I mean... It's all right there. That's the whole thing. So. Blessed Bertalla Longo, who sold his soul to the devil, who and had a lot of despair because of that, because the devil will be like, you can't ever, you, there's nothing you can do to make up for that. Uh, he, a Dominican, taught him about the rosary. And so he, one of his quotes from Blessed Bertalla Longo was that if you promote the rosary, you'll be saved. And I read last night from St. Alphonsus Liguori. I posted it on my live stream. I hope I'm not stealing your quote. All you, <laughs> Probably. <laughs> I'm stealing your quote. He said, pray the rosary, wear the scapular. Even if you do nothing else, you'll be saved. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> That's such a, <laughs> That's such a good one, right? Yeah. Also about death, uh, Dominic Savio, who was a pupil of St. John Bosco, died a young, at a young age. And he, St. John Bosco, I mentioned earlier, is known for having dreams and visions. St. Dominic Savio came back to visit John Bosco and... He, Don Bosco asked him, how was death? What was it like to die? And he says, I would have been terribly afraid had it not been for all the rosaries that I prayed. <laughs> One wow. last quote from Alphonsus Liguari about death. This is important because we are not pagans. So yes, if you, death is fearful if you've lived a bad life. Because you imagine if you know better about hell and you didn't change or you didn't say yes to the graces that God was giving you, death is going to be like, you're going to be squealing. You're going to be begging and I just can't believe that people still say no, but it all requires God's grace. But this is what Alphonsus says. And the beautiful thing about Alphonsus is when you're reading books of Alphonsus, you're not reading Alphonsus. <laughs> you're reading quotes from other saints. <laughs> no, that's true. So I'm it's like, true. this is what St. Alphonsus said, but really he's quoting St. Bernard. Death is not only the end of labor, but it is also the gate of life, says St. Bernard. He who wishes to see God must necessarily pass through this gate. This is the gate of the Lord. The just shall enter into it, and God shall wipe away every tear and every sorrow. And so, and I've seen this in, uh, I've when I was going through this wild depression and fear about death, I started studying scientific near-death experiences. I remember you telling me about And tried to like reckon. deep dive. I did a deep dive, man, <laughs> deep dive. And there was a couple of common threads between all of them. Obviously, none of them face the judgment because if they face the judgment, they we would not have heard back from them. It would have been like they're straight up dead. So all of them said that the moment that they're that they died physically, whatever torment, whether that means there was one woman, for example, she was in a, a, a canoeing accident, her leg broke, she was drowning at the same time, she, her whole body was wrenched in pain because she was stuck inside the current and her body was banging up against terrible pain. But the instant that she died, she said that all. All of the pain went away. She had all of a sudden peace, uh, physically physical peace, because I don't know why, but all if you if you imagine our bodies are being susceptible to the world, like gravity's pulling on us, age is wearing on us, whatever pains you have, the moment that you die, all of that pain is gone in an instant. She said she was overwhelmed with love. She did see a light, and she ended up coming back to life. But one common thread is that all of them didn't have death anxiety or death fear anymore because they kind of saw that it was just a passing. There was just this security in them that they had, like it was a gate. And so there's a lot of science that you can study into that. Some people claim weird and crazy things and no doubt that the devil can be manipulating. But one of the common threads is peace, a great light, uh, no more fear of death, um, which all aligns with what we would believe up, up until the judgment, of course, for the way we lived our lives. So one last thing about death is that I don't know what I will be and how I will be. God willing, I'll be in the state of grace of the hour of my death. But my Marian sacramental, I can only imagine that I'm going to be clutching my scapular because it, it's kind of like Mary's little ticket, Mary's little protection. And St. Alphonsus was said to be so fond of the scapular and he always had it on him that even after they exhumed his body, the scapular was completely intact and as if it was fresh. So we're going to go ahead and transition. We mentioned that we try to do Mary's will and talk about the things that Mary wants us to talk about. We get that in prayer. Last week, as we ended the show, we were packing up 
Keenan and I were like, who should be on next week? Is it Adrian's time? I was like, I don't know, Mary, you got to tell us. Is it Adrian's time? And, and then Keenan was like, you know, he's reading The Glories of Mary by St. Alphonsus. I said, oh, wow. <laughs> and then Keenan goes home and he texts me. Do you remember what you texted me? He just finished, Adrian just finished The Glories of Mary and his feast day. It's today. It's today. So yeah. what are the odds? St. Alphonsus' is feast day. He's finishing the glories of Mary on St. Alphonsus. This guy loves St. Alphonsus. Adrian, can you tell us a little bit about St. Alphonsus, some remarkable things that you stand yes. out to in his life? Yeah, yeah. So he, um, right there with Padre Pio, mm -hmm. he's one of, uh, he's my favorite saint right next to Padre Pio. Probably my favorite saint to talk about because of the life that he lived and, and the specifically the devotion he had to Our Lady was just it was crazy how much he loved her and, and how much fruit came from that. And it's sad. We were talking about this the other day. It's sad how under-celebrated he is yes. now. He was a huge deal in the 19th century. Yes. Huge deal. Gregory the Sixteenth canonized them in um, 1839. And he, he, had that, he has that famous quote. Tell me. Says, tell me it again because it can't be underestimated. Yeah, he says that any, any theologian or teacher or moralist can safely teach any opinion of St. Alphonsus. And it'd be okay. And not an opinion being that like the church hasn't kind of landed one way or the other on something. Right. But if St. Alphonsus said it. And even good. if you don't understand the reasoning, you can still teach it. Right, right. And then right. you work your way backwards. Yeah. So he was he was a huge deal huge. in the in the nineteenth century and we've kind of uh kind of let him go, which is which is sad. But he, he's making a comeback. He's one of my favorite saints. Um Zeal. Zeal. zeal he souls. he is the he the Doctor Zela Montissimus. He that is mean? the most zealous doctor. That is his official name and as a doctor of the church. Theologically, zeal comes from love. So he yeah. must have had a lot of love. Oh, his charity and the charity with which he approached everyone was um, as if it was the last person on earth. He had uh, his priest friends said the same thing of him. Just, you know, he'd preach kind of hard. And, and today right. we look back on yes. him and we think, talk about that. Yeah. we think, oh, what a harsh, what a harsh uh, moralist. Like, how can we live up to Rigorous. these standards? Yeah. But back then he was seen as this great patron of mercy. The most merciful man. Yeah, and and they and people saw that and, and souls flocked to that. So we got so, issues today. We do. And so we he do. he uh he really evangelized the poor and cared for them. Um but in his early fifties he his uh he started to become very sick. His his health really started to fail. So he didn't write his first book until he was forty nine. And that first book is this book, The Glories of Mary. Yikes. It was his first book. Uh so for the, the last 40 years of his life, he wrote over 100 books. I heard from a redemptorist priest some of the vows he took, and it's just, it's it's extraordinary. And the last of which is the coolest. Give me the last. Do you know? I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I want to tell you, it's okay. just a view. It's just go, a view. Okay. He, I want the best. Oh, yeah. I'll give you, know you the me, best I'm an last. i the best person. <laughs> He took his first, his fourth vow, his first, fourth vow was to never be idle. Oh, I like that. He took a, a vow to pray the Stations of the Cross every day. He took a vow to pray the dolors of the, the, the sorrows of Mary every day, to preach on her every single Saturday, and to fast on bread and water every Saturday in her honor. Love it. And the last and coolest oh. vow that he took, he took a, a vow to pray all 15 decades of the rosary every day. Wow. wow. Oh. So he's one of us. <laughs> yeah. He's one of know, us. I didn't know. No, we're, hey. we're one of his. <laughs> <laughs> wait, wait, this is so interesting because yesterday, have you guys ever heard of the fivefold scapular? Yeah, it has like all the colors, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. So the redemptorists were the ones, the first ones to like put them all together. Mm. And everything you just okay, said like that he the does, math. the seven sorrows, the devotion yeah. to the sacred, oh, like all the this, passion, yeah, yeah. it's the fivefold. That's so wow. interesting. And, wow. and according to the redemptorists, they also were the ones who were the guardians of your favorite icon. Yes. Oh, my goodness. Our Lady of Perpetual Help. Yes. Mm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they do good work. They, they have do. cool stuff going on here. Yeah. Every time you, every time Claire speaks and you don't see her, say a little petition to the Virgin Mary that if she wants to tell us, <laughs> we get it. Don't worry, I'm putting on other people. <laughs> yeah. Um. And so, yeah, he pre he vowed to pray the That's entire awesome. Rosary every day. I love this guy. Um. He's Doctor the only of the Church. He's the only Catholic who's ever lived who went on to be a bishop, religious founder, and Doctor of the Church. Only one ever. Um. And I have I have a few quotes here of his that are quite extraordinary. The first of which is probably the coolest. No true child of Mary is ever lost. Mm. No I love true, that one. No I true child it. of Mary is ever Ooh, lost. The true is the questionable part. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, what does I that mean? mean? What do you think he means by the true? Just never losing losing faith or hope in, in her yeah. intercession. Love it. Yeah. So no, no true child of Mary is ever lost. Yeah. Uh, he he's he's quoted as saying in his in his books, "He who prays is most certainly saved, 
and he who does not pray is most certainly damned. Thanks. He who pray, and he also said, he who prays the most receives the most. Yes. Not that. Not that we we pray to right. to receive things, not. right? But he said, you can know. I, can I make a caveat? Yes. So yeah. some people are against the luminous mysteries, and one of my arguments against them is that. Objectively speaking, according to St. Alphonsus, doctor of the church, objectively speaking, he who prays the most gets the most. So all things considered, we have somebody, no offense, let's just use St. Alphonsus as an example. Yeah. Let's pretend he has a twin who lives today. And they have the same purity of intention. They have the same fervor and devotion as mm, they pray. Mm. Young St. Alphonsus only prays 15 decades. Old, modern St. Alphonsus prays 20 decades. Objectively speaking, according to his own words, the one who prays for, prays the most, gets the most. Case closed. Alphonsus, the glory doctor of the church. <laughs> Sure, yeah. That's a really good point. Um, one of his most famous quotes is, He who trusts himself is lost, uh -oh. but he who trusts in God can do all things. I love it. Yeah. Uh, you'll love this one. Realize that you may gain more in a quarter of an hour of prayer in the presence of the Blessed Sacrament okay. than in all other practices of the day. Whoa. Yes, I love it. It's huge. Mother Teresa said, obviously, as you know, the most precious time you'll spend on earth is before the Blessed Sacrament. Yeah. Love it. Yeah. Say that one again. Repeat that because we, so many people are like, do you love Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior? And it's like, yeah, I do. <laughs> yeah. Catholics, too. Like Catholics that. too. Yeah. They say they love Jesus. Well, where Jesus is really in the adoration chapel, folks. You can't tell me you love Jesus. The person that you're in love with is, I guess, the historical Jesus because the living <laughs> Jesus is over there. Where are all the lovers of Jesus? You got to go to the chapel. And Sorry. I think, and I think, Prayer helps you pray more. Like yes. it's not, you know, it's not gonna. You're not gonna just become somebody that's very prayerful just by like thinking about you it. Got to go to the chapel, and you gotta get to go know to the, the one who made you. And as yes. you get to know the one who made you, the more you fall in love, and the more you want to spend time with him. What else you got? And the, you stole it earlier. Sorry, you say it. Say it. <laughs> Those who say the whole rosary every day, and I put whole in parentheses because to him the rosary was the that's 15th right. Decade. Every quote we it hear about not... the rosary before the modern era is yeah. about the entire rosary. Yeah, right? yeah. And to be clear, John Paul II prayed the full rosary every day. Yes, he did. He did. If not more. Yeah. No, he prayed. He prayed so yes. many rosaries. Uh, Those who say the whole rosary every day wear the brown scapular daily, and who do a little more will go straight to heaven. Straight. Those who say the whole rosary every day. And wear the brown scapular every day, and who do a little more will go straight to heaven. Dude, repeat it one more time. <laughs> Those who say the whole rosary every day, wear the brown scapular every day, and who do a little more will go straight to heaven. My my gosh. And that, that and that, you know, that is the love and the faith and just the he, he everything he had was in Jesus and Mary. Like just it was amazing. The highest authority in the church. Yeah. And and then that's that kind of segues into. I want to talk a little please, bit about please. what, what you're, he says you're, in you're his blowing book. Blowing my mind right now. Um, and what I came to realize by by reading this, because um, a lot of it, half of this book is simply what Saint Bernard said. Yes, <laughs> six hundred years before him, which is amazing. Um, but all good Mar Mariology, everything we believe and say about Mary, it comes from everything we believe and say about Jesus. All Mariology is rooted in good Christology. Yep. So if you don't really know and love Jesus. And you can't really know and love Mary. And so I'm reading this and I'm like, every, everything he's saying about Mary, it comes, and it really, St. Augustine, I'll go to that quote first. Please, he, please. he talks about, um, let me find it really quick. He goes, so in his fifth chapter of his book, it's mm. the best chapter in the book, it's, it's called Mourning and Weeping. So he, his book, the first half of it is about, he kind of breaks down the Hail Holy Queen, kind of like we do in the Catechism mm. with the Creed. Yes. So he breaks it down little by little, the Holy Queen. Um, and the one, his chapter on Mary is Mediatrix of All Grace. It's my favorite. It's amazing. And so he goes on and on and on about how all the graces we receive from God come through her. Yes. Doctor after doctor after doctor said so. Anselm, Thomas, Bonaventure, Bernard, just one after the other. Everything we receive from God comes through Mary because he ordained it so, right? Like he, he didn't have to do that. But it was most fitting, and so he, cho he chose Mary as the mediatrix in the avenue of all grace. And so after saying all these things that m might get people riled up in his book, he says, If there is nothing else to take away our fear of exceeding in the praises of Mary, St. Augustine should suffice. <laughs> For he declares that whatever we say in praise of Mary is in little comparison with that which she deserves on account of her dignity as mother of God. Everything we believe and say about her, it goes back to her being 
truly the mother of God, not the mother of a nature, but the mother of the divine person, Jesus Christ. And so you, he expounds upon that in so many ways in this book. Um, and it's just amazing. So yeah, I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about some things he talks about. The first chapter is, uh, it's, you know, the first words of the Hail yeah. Holy Queen, Hail Holy Queen, Mother of Mercy. And I remember reading this first chapter many months ago, and he says that St. Thomas Aquinas says that when the Holy Spirit conceived the second person of the Holy Trinity in the womb of Mary, mm -hmm. um, that at that moment, the kingdom of heaven was split, that Jesus maintained, uh, you know, the, his lordship over the justice of the world, but that all the mercy was given to Mary. Oh. That the kingdom was split in two, and so and so we don't call her the mother of justice. And I told her friend, I was like, "Thank God that she's not the mother, of, and she's simply the mother of mercy." Uh, Saint Anselm says the same that that we go to her as the mother of mercy, and she knows she knows no other way. Mm -hmm. It's it's in her who she is as a virgin and mother. Um, the the mother of God is to care for us as her children, and she does it with mercy. So I remember reading that and. St. Thomas, Aqu Thomas Aquinas had this amazing quote that yeah, God gave all mercy to her. Um, he, 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 he himself is the Lord of mercy, right? But he chooses to exercise it through her. So all of these great theologians, they're talking about this theologically. It's not just like some pious, yeah. you know, random stuff that we... Yeah, and it's crazy because he was, he was accused of being a Mary worshiper wow. when he was alive. One of the most brilliant men who's lived in the past several hundred years they thought was just this overly zealous, like, oh, he's just, this is just hyperbolic language, blah, blah. I even read an article the other day, uh, like, what do we do with hyperbolic language on, on the Virgin Mary? And they were trying to rationalize. And right. I was like, no, we read the, the most devotional and just the holiest men who love Mary, the things they said about her. Yes, they came from the heart, but they were within, really within the framework of, of sound theology. Yes. It wasn't like they were just spouting whatever they felt like saying like they, these men were brilliant and and they knew um and so and, reading reading what he says in here is just and amazing. so we mentioned earlier that he desired nothing more than to love mary more than any other man that ever lived so when people are like i don't feel like i'm close to mary how can i get close to mary well you got to read the writings of the men who loved her the most yeah yeah and we have we have you know this is one one thing i told you and i tell our friends is we're told uh there's this nice little saying um, we're all called to be saints. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we're all called to be saints, and that's good and it's true. But it's sad because no one expects us to act like one. No one expects us to read like one. No one expects us to pray like one. Um, and so we have we have to look at the lives of the saints. They we lift them up for a reason, right? We 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 they're canonized saints because they live lives of heroic virtue. But there's a you know there's a reason, and so we can look at their lives and be like, oh. That, you know, the modern day saints too, JP too, and, and Mother Teresa, we look at their lives and we're like, okay, it's this, it's this framework that we have. Um, and so it's, it's frustrating. We're told to, we're all called to be saints. And then no one that's expects like the, us to like do the anything mantra. about that's like it. That's the mantra. Yeah, no one expects us to do anything about right. it. More, now more than ever, no one expects us to actually live like one. Yeah, we like throwing this saying around like, oh, you're called to be a saint, go and... Do that. I remember I was I was somewhere with uh, this group of with elementary kids, um, and one of the people running it, this seven year old girl asked, "How do you become a saint?" And like my heart, I was just like, "Oh my gosh, what that question came from God? That's amazing." And the person was like, said some you know just a typical answer of, "Well, you know, live live your life um, well each day and, and love God and just do the best you can." I'm like, "That's that's not a bad answer." But afterward, I, I, I stepped forward and then I had to step back. So I was like, this is not my place <laughs> to be like, that's nice. But um, so afterwards, I walked up to the little girl and I, I took my rosary out of my pocket and I gave it to her. And I said, if you want to be a saint, pray this every day and you'll be a saint. Love Boom. It. Beautiful. Um, Boom. And I've been praying. I've been praying for her and I, I entrust her to Mary. And another passage he, t he touches on in here is um, he talks about Mary as um, as mother. Mm -hmm. And how and it's my, this is my personally, my favorite Bible passage, my, my favorite Bible verse in, in all of scripture is, is Luke one forty three. after, after Mary has greeted her cousin and it says that, um, hearing, hearing the greeting of Mary, Elizabeth, 
cried out in a loud voice and having, you know, filled with the Holy Spirit, said, blessed art thou among women and blessed is the fruit of thy womb. Well, the next line says, how is it that it should come to me that the mother of my Lord should come to me? Whence is it to me that the mother of my Lord should come to me? And I, I look at our lives, me, Kenan's life and my life, and I think that fewer things mark our lives more than those words. <laughs> how, is it, how is it that the mother of my Lord should come to me in, in such a way? Uh, and so it's my favorite, it's my favorite passage. And, and St. Alphonsus says that it was fitting, we are, we are shown in sacred scripture that it is fitting to thank and praise the mother of our Lord and that this itself is, is sufficient to thank our Lord himself. It says she was filled with the Holy Spirit and she, she didn't say, how is it that my Lord should come to me? She said, how is it that the mother of my Lord should come to me? And that's always stuck out to me. And I, I pray with that a lot. And, and I think, I thank God that he, he sent his mother to, to, to take me in her arms. Padre Pio says, uh, abandon yourself into the hands of Mary and she will take care of you. Um, so that's amazing. And the last, uh, this book is just absolute gold. I mean, everything he says in here is it's just amazing. Um, I underlined and, and, and bracketed and asterisk so much. It took me forever <laughs> what, to finish what, what, it. Give people the title again. The Glories of Mary by St. Alfonso Seguori. Um, I, I believe it's his first book he ever wrote. Um, and it's just sound, sound theology. Um, and he, like you said, in his books, he just, he just quotes a bunch of other, I mean, he, he himself, um, dives in deep sure. and, and says amazing things, but he, he's resting on those who came before him, right. uh, especially St. Thomas Aquinas and St. Bernard, St. Bonaventure, St. Francis de Sales, who... Doctors of the church. All, all of them doctors. Yeah. All doctors. St. Anselm, St. Augustine, St. Chrysostom, uh, St. Francis de Sales And it's said, funny that today we follow fools and idiots who are emotionalists, <laughs> but we're not listening to the doctors of the church who've like yeah. sustained and fed the hearts of men for yeah, ages. Yeah, there's, exactly like, right. there's only like 36 of them. Yeah. We were, this church has been around for 2,000 years, and we only have 36 doctors, I believe. Comparatively to how many saints we have. Yeah, thousands. So thousands and thousands like and thousands of saints. Something like that. Um, there's only 36 doctors. And the things they said about Mary, we would be remiss and, and truly regretful were we not to heed them. And they all sound hyperbolic, and yet the church is saying, these are the ones to listen to. Yeah, and even on her feast days, he, he, he loves talking about the words that the church applies to Mary on her feast days through, through the sacred canticles, through um, Proverbs, through Ecclesiastes, like the things that the prophet said and the, the Old Testament writers said, the church herself today applies these words to Mary on her feast days. Uh, which is beautiful. And the last thing I'll talk about with St. Alphonsus is uh, the importance of going to Mary. Why, you know, we hear today, we hear from our friends, we hear why, why, why do I need to go to Mary? I, why, why can't I just go to Jesus? And that, I mean, they're, they're right, right? They're right to the question and kind of be a little afraid of, of that. But saying that all the, the saints, the doctors, St. Alphonsus, I'm going to have to read this part Please. because, um, it's such an amazing passage. Please. But it all, you know, for him and for the saints, it goes back to, to John chapter 2. Mm -hmm. The beginning of John chapter 2, the, the wedding feast at Cana. Um, and so he, he starts with John chapter 2 and um, he quotes Bonaventure. But then he says, but how was this um, that our Lord who, seeming, who, who wasn't going to, um, he, he, it seemed like he wasn't going to fulfill Mary's wish and her command or to do, to do what she asked. Uh, but he says, um, as a time for working miracles was that a public life of our Lord, but how could it be that contrary to the divine decrees, this miracle was worked because he said, my hour is not yet come. He said, no. Yeah. He said, no, he said, no. And, um, St. Alphonsus, he quotes, uh, St. John Chrysostom. He says, that is the sense in which St. John Chrysostom understood it. For explaining these words of our Lord, woman, what is it to me and thee? He says that through Jesus, that though Jesus answered thus, yet in honor of his mother, he obeyed her wish. And this is confirmed by St. Thomas Aquinas, who says that by the words, my hour is not yet come, Jesus Christ intended to show that had the request come from any other, he would not ha have then complied with it. But because it was addressed to him by his mother, he could not refuse. And I mean, if we don't, if St. Thomas Aquinas, St. Thomas Aquinas doesn't do it for us, um, then I don't know what will. And it even says, 
that, that it was preordained, preordained from all eternity that Jesus would fulfill his mother's every wish. And we, and we find that in the writings of the saints. We find it first and foremost in, in that passage in John. I'm reading this book called The Book of Confidence. And no, he, he raves about this. I, I, ra- I rave about it. But, and, and, and I read, uh, there's, this applies to also the book Abandonment to Divine Providence. It applies to the practice of the presence of God. Because we are Marian and we are totally consecrated to Mary, every time I read a book like that, and I encourage you to do the same, I always apply whatever it is about God, I apply it to Mary. So in, in the book of Confidence, uh, Father, I don't remember his name. He says that every miracle that our Lord worked was because somebody had confidence. And it's, in the case of the wedding feast of Cana, the person who had the confidence was Mary. In the case of the friends lowering down their crippled friend, it was the confidence of the friend. The woman with the he- hemorrhages, it was the confidence of the woman. And so we have confidence in God and God will work these miracles. And we can see that through scripture. How much more confidence should we have if we're also going to the Virgin Mary? Like, wow, I think one of the greatest problems that I suffer from too, and many even devoted people is we don't have enough confidence in Mary and the things that she's be willing to do for us. Yeah, St. Saint, Saint Anselm, he said, he was a great doctor of the church, he said, and he loved Mary. People don't know St. Anselm's devotion to Our Lady, um, but he said that he, he, as we say, that there are things that God will only grant through prayer through Mary. Well, there are things that we we ask our Lord Himself, and it seems like they're not granted. But the the saints tell us that, and Scripture tells us that there are there are certain things that can only be granted by going to Mary. And if God loves Mary most of all, it would only follow to reason that the greatest things God will only grant because of Mary, because He loves her the most. Yeah, yeah, and um, that that amazing analogy that that Saint Louis de Montfort has in his book that um, we Christ is the King. Mary is the queen and we are the poor citizens of, of this kingdom. And that were we to bring, and we're poor, and so we want to, we want to honor the king and give him whatever we have, whatever we can. Um, but likely he likened our offering to a rotten apple. Yeah. And um, we could give, we could give our, our, the only thing we have, a rotten apple to the king and, and he would appreciate it and he loves us as, as his children. But when we give it to Mary... Mary, he says, puts our our unworthy gift on a silver platter, makes it look nice, and she gives it to the king herself and says, this is from your son, Adrian. This is from your son, Gabe. And it means all the more coming from her. It means all the more coming from her because of how much he loves her. And some people will say, counter and say, well, I go directly to Jesus. And very good, you can go to Jesus too, but doesn't Jesus deserve a beautiful apple on a silver platter? And I simply mm. cannot give it to him. <laughs> oh, so is. out of justice, yeah. the King of Kings deserves the greatest. I cannot provide him the greatest. So why not give it to him through the one who can? It's an act of humility. It's an act of humility. Yeah, that's what yeah. St. Louis says, humility. Gives her, me goosebumps. Her greatest, goosebumps. <laughs> her, gra- her greatest virtue and, and everything, you know, everything we love and say about her and the reason God chose her was because of her humility. Now, everything stemmed and flowed from that. Yes. Beautiful. There's nothing greater to end on than a discussion on humility. Let us go ahead and conclude in prayer. Adrian, will you lead us in the Hail Mary? Certainly. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women. And blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Holy Mary, Mary, Mother of God, God, pray pray for for us sinners sinners now and and at the hour hour of our death. death. Amen. Amen. Thank you all for joining us today. If Again, if you'd like to watch this, you're going to have to go over to the YouTubes, www.youtube.com, and search True Faith TV. Because eventually these aren't going to be on Gabi After Hours anymore because Gabi After Hours is about high-quality productions. And although this is a high-quality production, (laughs) we've got other topics. So go over to True Faith TV, hit subscribe, hit subscribe here. If you'd like to support this program, go to truefaith.tv, the website, slash support. Also, hey, Memento Mori. (laughs) Want to think about death every day with your morning coffee? You can get that Memento Mori mug. Claire, am I forgetting anything? Uh, Nope, you are not. God bless you. God lo- oh, Adrian. One one last quote please, earlier. I was going to say St. Francis de Sales tells us that the greatest method of prayer is to pray the, the rosary, to pray the Holy Rosary. I love it.
doctor of the church. Yeah, I love one. it when doctors of the one. church say this because people will say to me personally and privately and publicly, Gabe, this is your opinion. Maybe you're a Mary guy. <laughs> the ro- the Big Mary not, guy. Mary, no, the they, they not, say that. They, they say that. They <laughs> say that. And then I, I can only think in the end, we're going to find out how wrong you are. Doctor of the church. You align yourself with a doctor of the church. You don't go wrong. Doctors. The doctors. doctors that's back, right. Back to the two, three, four hundreds. I love it. Trust in Mary. Adrian, my brother. Thank you for having me. I love you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for being here. One last thing. This is what I love about the Children of Mary podcast is that you don't know Adrian. You've never heard of Keenan before. I'm a nobody. I've got a little pink office. I'm dying from asbestos poisoning. (laughs) That's always remind him. (laughs) Every day I'm like, I'm going to die in here. This very building we're in is falling apart. Claire, Claire just came out of nowhere. But the thing is, in where we live, we are so blessed that there are so many children of Mary, real friends who are all children of Mary. And why not bring them in? Because the children of Mary, it's the funny thing about being a child of Mary is that you can meet a child of Mary here. You can meet a child of Mary in Canada. And the second that you guys get together, your love for Mary, it's like family. I am comfortable yeah. now. Yeah, it's amazing. And last thing, Adrian always says, Mary always gives me the best. Tell us about that. Oh, yeah. <laughs> because your child, Mary gives the best to all of her children. And that's not what I do, what I do, and why I pray. No, of course Certainly. not. Certainly. Um, yeah, there's just been so many instances when I, I look, um, when I when I trusted in God, when I trusted in his providence, um, it's something you you taught us and that we try to practice, you know, you call to mind God's presence and, and he provides and, and you have faith and you go forth with confidence. Um, and and I, all my prayers, you know, they're to God through Mary. Um, the the avenue by which grace comes to us is the most fitting avenue by which our prayers should should be returned to God, and and so I I, I pray to God through Mary and the thing <laughs> the way that she provides uh, you know with material goods but but more so with with my family life and my friends and and every her hand her handprint is just on everything. Um, yeah, and she yeah she gives me lots of good things. But but we have to remember that. <laughs> The children of Mary end up on the cross. Yeah. They always end up on the cross. And also, Jesus said that his burden is easy and his yoke is light. And he's, you know, also has justice involved mixed in with that. How much sweeter, how much easier is the burden of being a child of Mary? And with that, we conclude. God bless you. God love you. And we'll see you tomorrow. Or no, we'll see you soon. (laughs) I'm all over the map. God bless you. God love you. We'll see you soon.